I'm Sue Morgan, Executive Director and Acting Joint CE at Design Council. For this second year running, we're really pleased to be headline sponsors of the Festival of Place and the Pineapple Awards. Our experience and research shows that well-designed neighbourhoods and places have a transformative impact. The spaces between buildings, the blue and the green in the grey, creating fantastic places to live. This is why we are pleased and excited to sponsor the awards for excellent placemaking and place design at the Pineapple Awards this year. Please join us to celebrate the role design can play in helping us live more happy, healthier and sustainable lives. My name is Christine Murray and I'm the founding editor-in-chief of The Developer and the founding director of the Festival of Place. The Pineapples are all about celebrating best practice and awards are a powerful way to recognize the ambition and realization of great places. So we're grateful to the Design Council who have sponsored these awards since their inception and continue to support us this year and helping us shape some of the judging and processes around the way we review these projects. These awards are about the quality of the spaces created between the buildings and success from the citizen, resident, tenant, or customer point of view. The pineapple is a traditional architectural symbol of welcome in the UK, and that's one thing we believe great places should be welcoming. So the pineapples are judged in two or three parts, depending on the category, which involves reviewing the application and visiting the sites or spaces. And the final stage is always a live presentation to the judges where they have the opportunity to ask our pineapple shortlistees about their ambitions for the project. The finalists have 10 minutes to present their project, and that's followed by a 10 minute Q&A with the judges. And our judging panel is Ashling Ramshaw, Head of Sales and Marketing from CEG. Catherine Dewar, Regional Director, Northwest of Historic England. Sam White, a director at Knight Architects. And so I'm going to introduce our um, first presenter from uh, Allied London. It's Elizabeth Peckett, Associate Director, and I'm gonna invite her up to uh, join me on stage and begin her presentation. Okay, so my, uh, my first presentation is um, on behalf of Allied London um, and it, uh, relates to our lead stock scheme, which has been nominate, nominated for the pineapple for um, for completed place at the festival this year. Um, so this um, this project is um, it was a repositioning and a redevelopment project. Uh, we we bought a site that had, had already been built, um, but the original developers they created a high end retail area with flats. Um, but after the 2008 recession, the high-end retail that was mirrored in the, uh, in the city centre, uh, together with no real transport links um, for this site, no, people didn't really have a, have a reason to visit. Um, so we set out to rebrand, um, to reinvest and to create Leeds first tech, media and creative industries hub. Um, so we're now home to... 15 digital and tech companies, as well as Sky's Digital HQ. Um, let me just make this full screen. Oh, I can't do that, I'm afraid. <laughs> so uh, the switch to focus to office space has been um, has given more people an affinity with these documents, it's given them more of a reason to, to be there. Um, and that's brought with it more commercial opportunities as well. So tenants such as North Star Coffee Shop and Primal Gym have fast become a hub for both office and the local residents to use. Um, that drives a local community feel in a city centre development. We also added a brilliant management team covering security and cleaning to make the, fit, the place feel clean and safe. Um, we, then, we then had a good place. We then, we then had to add the wow factor. 
So we have hosted a range of events at New Dock Hall, the Conference Centre, Armory Square, and on the, on the dock itself using the water. Um, that teams up with street food and, um, as you can see in the picture, our now iconic water taxis. So Allied London have re-established a pride in this place um, from the local residents and from the new workers and given people a reason to visit. So in order to present today, I wanted to choose three words that I thought really sum up Leeds Dock. And the three words I've chosen are sustainability, public realm and well-being. So starting off with sustainability. So by sustainability, I mean by the wider meaning of the, of the word is that the place we bought in 2012 was not sustainable. It had all but failed. Even though people were living there, the ground floors were empty, the public realm was not used and it was termed a ghost town. Um, so what we set out to add was a business community, and then we created amenities that would suit both the business and the residential communities. Um, and we now have a really varied inventory. So this map that's on the screen will just look like a map with loads of numbers. Um, but what this means is each of those buildings has a different use. Um, so you can see the varied amount of uses there. Um, we have independent food and drink operators. So we have a coffee roastery, the first, uh, the first in Leeds. Um, we've got a bakehouse. Uh, we have um, the Royal Armouries Museum. So we've got the culture element, which has an amphitheater and exhibition hall. In March this year, we, um, we, uh, we, had, we have Leeds um, TV studio, which is for Channel 4 and they broadcast live daily uh, for Channel 4. Um, on TV with Steph's packed lunch. Um, we have a village hall. We have, we have different creative workspaces. We have a bike club, um, a hotel. Um, so just in terms of transport as well, we realized that people, it's 10 minute, 10 to 12 minute walk from, from the train station. Um, but the reason why it was always deemed to be such a sustainable place is because it was always meant to be uh, one of the major stops for a mass transit system in Leeds, um, but that never came to fruition or it hasn't yet. So we bought two yellow water taxis from Amsterdam and we run a service now from Leeds Dock to the station every day. Um, that was free for five years and we now charge a pound per journey um, just to cover our costs on that. Um, and we have, in terms of cycling, a dedicated cycle storage area um, a multi-story car park with more cycle bays, um, bikes to hire, um, bike routes, and then bus and buses, walking routes, and a taxi drop-off area. So all of these things, from the museum to the hotel to the transport to what we have, it's this varied in inventory that we've worked really hard to build to make it a really sustainable place that will be visited for years to come. And it's this inventory that attracted Channel 4 to come to open their, their live broadcast TV studio, studio with us um, this year. Um, so we're a constantly evolving place. Um, we're dynamic and we can change. We've got places that can be changed every quarter or every year. Um, for example, we can add different pontoons to the water um, for a fashion show, or we can have some art installations out on there. We do dragon boat racing every year. We have a monthly canoe club. And our current project is to make some socially distanced work pods on the water as well. So our next, the next word I thought of was public realm. So as I said, we, we inherited a place. We inherited this public realm. Um, but it, it, it has incredible water in the middle of it. And we couldn't quite work out how it wasn't yet a place. Um, We've got amazing water in the middle of the buildings, but the retail wasn't working and people just passed through the public realm. They weren't stopping, they weren't using it for any reason. So we decided to redesign and redefine the public realm to have a, a proper purpose. We enhanced the quality of the environment. We created unique spaces for the community to enjoy. And both the residents and the office workers now use it for, and they have a sense of belonging. Um, 
in terms of design, we we enhanced, we softened it. We added places to dwell, to eat, to have a picnic. Um, and it's a place for living. We do have to remember that there are 2,000 people living above our spaces. So it's a, we really concentrate on the fact it's a place for living. It doesn't need to be a big humdrum of leisure and constant large scale activities. Um, so we've only made natural additions. We haven't tried to force any elements in that wouldn't be suitable. Um, one element that's really popular is this street, which is um, just behind the water. It's called the Boulevard. It was just a great, um, great concrete corridor, really, a bit of a wind tunnel, as you can see from the left. Um, we added a running track in the middle. Um, we've added more trees, more colour, more places to sit, um, covered areas. Um, so we can see every day how popular the new public realm is. Uh, which leads me on nicely to well-being. So well-being is, um, is a huge, we want to become known as the healthiest place to work or live in Leeds. Um, because of the water, we can, uh, we can run canoe clubs, um, we do dragon boat racing every year. Um, there has there have been triathlons with open water swimming. The water is a salt course for them, so they could use the amphitheater. Um, they could use the water. They could use um, the areas around the dock. Um, they team up with the yoga studio. Our running club, um, the bikes, um, in terms of the cycling enthusiast, and enthusiast, we've got the bike to hire, we've got the cycle storage, etc. Um, and we've got all the green, green spaces and the uh, canal routes to walk and sit. So in conclusion, our mantra um, in, in, in the entirety for lead stock is to be sustainable and use great design and use the public realm to the best of our abilities. Um, so being doing our best is the thing that drives us um, and that will continue to drive us as we take further steps we're going to redevelop the old casino on site and keep thinking of the next thing to create. Uh, Ashling, do you want to kick off and, and put your question to Elizabeth? Yeah that was great Elizabeth thank you um, I live in Leeds so I'm, I'm familiar um, with Leeds stock and the transformation oh. that's that's happened there it's great um, I, I was just interested to know um, the process. So there, there's, there's um, the apartments, I think, have always been sort of let, haven't they, from the start. Mm. What sort of um, engagement did you do with the residents in developing the, the, the new place at Leeds Dock? And, and what of those things that, that people were looking for have you shown us then today or, or over the time you've been there? Yeah, um, yes, yeah, so that's right. So what, when we bought it, the long, the upper part of the building were let off a long leasehold. We bought a long leasehold of the ground floor commercial, commercial units plus the public realm. And we, with the residents, that's all we had at the start. So the residents are a hugely important part of our strategy um, throughout um, lockdown as well, when, with people working at home again, they become the forefront of, of what we have the place there for. Um, so we have a quarterly um, meetings with, with the residents that we invite them along to. Uh, we work with our local councillor, um, Paul Ray, really closely as well, who um, really make, wants to make sure that as property owners and placemakers, we are really um, working to what the residents' needs are. So they, they wanted it to be more like a useful village, like a town center for the South Bank of Leeds. So that if they live there, they're working there at the weekend, they don't necessarily have to walk all the way into the city center. Um, so that started to build up with the coffee roastery and the coffee shop, which is really popular every day of the week. The independent gym who um, really look after every person that goes in. It's, they've only got one gym. It's not like a, a chain where they don't know your name on the on the front desk they know everyone that goes to that gym and um and the yoga studio um uh, and yeah they, they the residents do continue to be a huge part of our strategy 
Brilliant. Catherine, I'm going to put it to you. Do you have a question you want to ask Elizabeth? I do. Yeah. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, I was really interested to, to read and hear about the fact that this was a, a kind of existing place that wasn't working mm. um, and what you did to change that. So you've talked to us about the events and what you've done with the public realm. Did you have to do anything physically with the buildings and the way they addressed the street? Uh, we did, yes. So the um, a lot of the shops that faced the water um, we have inside there, we've put mezzanine levels inside so that um, there's, there's the workspace operators, so Sky, who do all their tech from that building, they've got two floors inside what was a double height building to be able to create different meeting rooms, quiet rooms, um, spaces for um, staff to spill out away from their desk. Um, so we won awards for our, the design for the interiors of those of those um, spaces. And what I've noticed from my from my, my workspace occupiers is that if you walk around at the weekend, people use it almost like a second home. If they live quite close and they can go in, maybe on a Saturday afternoon they might watch um, some sport on TV around a big screen. Um, but it does mean that the employees are really using the spaces as as you would really hope as you were designing spaces that they're comfortable in them um, they we've added little gardens outside each um, workspace so that they can actually step out of their own space um, I, I brought over a glass box from um, from spinning fields actually that was a marketing suite that we didn't know what to do with I've put that on the side of the dock and I've opened that as a village hall almost like use it for whatever you feel like using it for it's just an extra additional space for um, for people um, and then the street that I showed earlier with the running track it was just a grey street with nothing on it but we've had to um, build new structures um, build some canopies make it um, weatherproof etc mm. okay thanks I'm going to turn to you now Sam for perhaps uh, the question from the architect's point of view mm -hmm. uh, you're on mute so make sure you unmute yourself Okay. Uh, no, it's been really good listening to all of you. Um, I'd like to think, uh, looking ahead, what do we think we're going to, in this project, what are we doing looking forward to the way people are going to use this in the future? Um, my next step is to build out uh, pon extra pontoons onto the water itself and then create some little pods. Um, so the feeling, if you're on a boat or if you're on a canoe, that feeling of the water around you is so, is calming um, and, it's, and it's unique, it's different. Imagine in the middle of your working day when you need a change of scene to be able to get that close to the water. Um, so I'm working with Canal and River Trust, who are um, really supportive of what we do at Leeds Dock, um, to build out the pontoons and then form some sort of structures on top where they can maybe seat two people at a distance and make them safe. Um, so my next stop, my next stop is really to um, activate the water um, for the next couple of years with something quite permanent. Um, and also, as you, as you might have seen, especially if you live in Leeds, at the back of our estate, we do have a big derelict 60,000 square foot casino, which has been on a long lease from a landlord to the casino operator for 20, well, it's been on that lease for eight years, it's got another 12 to go. Um, and we've taken a sublease from the casino and we're now about to embark on converting that into rooftop terrace, cinema, event spaces, workspaces, underground floor, restaurant and bar. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, you're actually up right away again. So uh, I'm just going to send you right, right back into presentation mode. But uh, thank you very much, judges. If you guys could turn your cameras off, you can actually just stay here. Um, and I will um, here we go. So Sam, if you can turn off your camera, or I can do that for you, actually, I think. Um, and, uh, and then yeah, back to share screen and, and on to presentation two.
Um, just a, a bit of a background to spinning fields. Um, over the last 20 years, Allied London have been developing spinning fields. It's 22 acres um, and it has now grown to become one of Manchester's leading destinations. Um, so the proposal to create the central business district in Manchester originated when Allied London purchased a number of buildings around the John Rylands Library. Um, Manchester City Council uh, were keen to redevelop this area following the 1996 Manchester bombing. Um, and we'd done our research and we knew that higher end retail and restaurants would be, were missing and it would be different to what Manchester already had. Um, at, that, at the beginning, Manchester only had one restaurant that turned over £50,000 a week. Um, and we now have six in spinning fields alone turning over, over £100,000 a week. Um, and also what we've learned over the last three to six months is that whilst we're a business destination and home to over 165 commercial organisations, we're also a restaurant destination in our own right. So from July, as restaurants were open, but the office workers weren't back on site in, in, in any sort of great number, um, our footfall was just as high and on some days higher than the same time last year. And um, so the draw of the IV, 20 stories, the Oast House, Australasia, Tattoo and Alchemist um, are all a huge attraction from locals and also from people further afield. They come to spinning fields for, for a specific reason. Um, we've also got the added attraction of different squares where we can introduce pop-up bars and restaurants and an exciting year-round public events program so that, um, so that it's different every time people come. Um, so I've used the same uh, process where I've thought of three words that I thought uh, really helped to sum up spinning fields for you. Uh, the first one is design. So the key to making spinning fields sustainable has always been to think ahead to five to 10 years time. Um, and we have designed it so that it's capable of um, evolving rather than stagnating and, and being the same. We have to create reasons for people to carry on visiting. Um, so because we don't have a large residential population here, our customers have to come uh, by choice. And they also, it's a dynamic, it's not the same person every time. So the customer is constantly changing and the also constantly changing. Um, so we have well-designed and used public realm and, and buildings which support our overall strategy. Um, and we when we designed the master plan, we designed the, the pedestrian roads, the anchors, uh, the entry points from scratch to be world-class. Um, we have this deliberate plan all along for the design and management strategy to ensure the spaces are commercially active um, all year round and safe. Um, and our occupiers, are, our workspace occupiers, they like being somewhere that's, that's vibrant with outdoor events and restaurants spilling out onto the public realm. Um, we've also got the culture, we've got the People's History Museum, the John Rylands Library, um, and we've had we've had outdoor cinemas. Um, it's all it all takes a lot of intensive management, but it is worth it. So we've got a, an exciting place. Um, so this brings me on to management quite nicely. Uh, we followed the process in New York, where the occupiers pay into a pot, which they get a lot of value out of. Um, you can have the best place in the world, but it has to be managed properly. Um, and over the years, we have used third party uh, companies to clean and to uh, do the security for us. But in the end, we invested in our own companies to make sure that they're the very best. Our mantra was always to make sure that um, single women walking on their own at night feel safe. Um, we want the security to be the best they possibly can be. Um, and, the, and the cleaning team as well. We make sure that there's no chewing gum on site. People are scraping off chewing gum off the street as you walk past on a Saturday morning. Um, and this just adds to the high quality feel that, um, that you get when you arrive in spinning fields. Um, so moving on to the brand. So the brand um, has only gone through two iterations. 
uh, one as it was a development and another new one as it was a completed place. Um, so the area took its name from Spinning Field, which was a narrow street running from Deansgate. Um, and then in 1968, Spinning Fields and the area to the south were turned into Spinning Field Square. And that's how the brand was born. Um, in the background there, you can see Northcliffe House on Deansgate, which was demolished. Um, it was a former Daily Mail building. Um, so once Spinning Fields was completed, uh, we relaunched the brand. Um, and this was to make, to make it, it's an established urban neighborhood. We needed a new concept then. We needed to balance high-end and exclusive nature of the area with the need to attract and appeal to a dynamic audience. Um, so the brand's it's got a, a range of colors. Um, there's a muted professional uh, set of colors um, to identify with the workers. And then there's um, a brighter set of colors uh, for, for our marketing and events teams. Um, we want the brand to let people know that they've arrived and to become that they've arrived in this place that we want to become known for quality, safety and cleanliness. Um, and we upkeep and we refresh the brand across our social media channels uh, regularly. There's a dedicated team working on that for us. Um, and we want to be able to portray this development in its best possible light. Thank you. So how about you, Catherine? Would you like to join us first this time? Yeah, and I um, I know Spinning Fields because I um, I work in Manchester, so um, I often have meetings in the area or walk walk through the area. Um, and I didn't know I didn't know Spinning Fields pre the redevelopment. I didn't know Manchester then, so um, I haven't got any sense of what was there before. Um, and working for Historic England and being really interested in sustainability of reuse of buildings. Mm. About how did you decide which buildings to keep um, and which buildings had to go? And did you just keep the ones that, that were listed and you had kind of had to? <laughs> uh, was the, you know, what, what was the discussion that went on at the time? I think um, I, I, I know that as you walk around it now, it does look very shiny and new. Yeah. Which, uh, but then we've also tried to balance, say, the John Ryland's Library on that square. That brings the atmosphere to that square. So um, the buildings themselves that, that were demolished, a lot of them were unfit for purpose. Um, and a lot of them, whereas, say, like the bonded warehouse in St. John's that we have next door that we have reimagined into something new has its own atmosphere a lot of spinning fields did need this sort of um uh it needed a a new footprint in order to to create the place that it is now that's that's viable and sustainable um what we did do as well is leave an awful lot of these open squares whereas in our original master plan um some of the squares crown square was meant to be built on uh, but then over time we the place is much better with big open squares um, in between and, and Crown Square has now been home to the Oast House, which is a temporary structure effectively, but a very successful one um, for the last five years. Okay, thanks. Sam, do you want to come in and ask a few questions? Um. I think you raised a really important thing about um, young women being able to come into public spaces. And I've got a young daughter and uh, uh, Charlie's coming now up to uh, being 14 years old. And I want her to be able to uh, be able to go into public spaces. I think it's really important that mm -hmm all of us as designers, we think about young women and, yeah. with, and the way that they can, you know, feel safe. Yeah. Um, um, but they they need to be able to go out and to be involved. Um, yeah, we, our security team, as well as uh, they don't, we've got a, um, a response team. So if a, one of the bars or restaurants has a problem with someone in inside their restaurant and they, eject them from their premises our community response team 
make sure that they also leave the the area in its entirety so they're not just going to go into the next place or hang around in, in the squares um, and then, and then ov obviously work with the police as well where necessary on that front. Ashling, do you have a question for Elizabeth? I do, yeah. Um, I, I was I had a walk around there um, last week and really impressed with your security, actually. Your mm -hmm. yellow vested team, they're really friendly and clearly looking out for people. So, and the place looks amazing. Um, I was just wondering with everything you've done and sort of um, reinvigorated the place, how, um, and you don't have to give details, but how successful commercially has that been for you? So in terms of the Manchester uh, commercial marketplace, you know, have you, have you positioned it at the sort of top end of the market now in terms of rents or? Yeah, yeah absolutely. So number one spinning fields is the building on Key Street that was our final building. And the rents achieved in that building were Manchester's record rents at, um, on the office space. Um, so whilst the office space rents can, can happily be high, we, haven't, we don't necessarily put that same pressure on the ground floors. We want to make sure the ground floor, the restaurants, F&B, smaller independents um, can thrive because those ground floors in the public realm is what makes the upper levels successful. Great, thank you. Thank you. We have a little bit more time. Can I ask you about uh, post-COVID, your offices and, and retail strategy kind of throughout lockdown and then perhaps go, looking forward? Yes, absolutely. Um, so with, uh, with Spinningfield, it's an open estate. We, in terms of safety and uh, post-COVID measured, it's very difficult to manage. If we were just one building or if we were just a, a place you could decide to close or open, we have, to, we have to manage open spaces, we have to manage individual buildings and the strategies inside. Um, our workforce are back at about 40% or they were over summer. Um, but as I mentioned in my presentation, our, our restaurants really have been thriving. I think people who were cooped up for three months wanted somewhere to go and they know when they come here, it's going to be safe Our, us, you know, there'll be all the protocols that you get in the best places will be in place here. So you won't be thinking, well, they're not wearing a mask and they're a bit close. You know, we've made sure that every um, experience feels safe. Um, but what we are doing now is, is the fact that um, some, of the, some of the restaurants won't survive this period. Um, uh, whether you know, that's not because of us, but if it's a group chain or something. Um, so the ones that have gone, um, we've decided to, um, on the avenue where we have Iberica who have left their premises, we're going to create a whole new outside, um, we call it the greenhouse. So it'll grow plants inside um, and as well as having seating areas. So it'll be like a brand new destination to go in spinning fields um, that leads from Deansgate down to where the Oast House is, um, which We've designed it based on European sort of food hall feels, but uh, sort of the look and feel, but um, it will be a safe place and to come. We, we're not stopping, even though our revenue is hugely down, we're moving on to the next thing because we know we need to be ready for 2022, 2023 to keep it relevant and one of the most visited places in Manchester. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much. I know that's not really um, part of judging <laughs> the judging process in that these are unexpected things that happen since you entered, but I think it's really yeah. fascinating to hear. Um, we have just a couple minutes left. So are there any other questions from Catherine's got a question? Yeah, yeah the, the, um, the mix of uses um, in terms of residential, how much residential is there in there and how does that impact on kind of activity throughout the day? Yeah, spinning fields, ha, ha, apart from left bank um, and the apartments along there, we really don't have a lot of residential throughout the rest of the estate. So activity um, can be louder and a bit more vibrant. You know, we know that we won't be getting the complaints as you might in other residential areas, but we do take into account left bank and the side along the river needs to be quieter than going up towards Deansgate where it's, um, you know, if we have an outdoor screening, we usually do a silent outdoor screen, screening anyway, but um, ultimately 
it's not it doesn't have as much of a play as if we were full of residents above okay thanks well that leaves me to just thank you for your two back-to-back -back, uh presentations mm -hmm. there and super interesting to have a visit uh to uh to to both those locations and some insight into into how they're changing moving forward so thanks for that um judges if you want to put your uh cameras off i'm going to invite our next speaker and bye elizabeth thanks so much and, thank and well done bye okay um we're absolutely delighted that the oxford uh roof terrace scheme has been nominated uh for a completed um place have been shortlisted for a completed place award um it's a project that um started quite some time ago in 2017 we were invited to submit design proposals as part of a competitive um, design process the the previous proposal um, had failed to address the client's aspirations and we presented what you'll see here which was the um, tender submission imagery uh, which presented a bold vision for the roof terrace spaces that engaged with the Oxford skyline and delivered a series of vibrant spaces that had a strong landscape narrative associated with them. We very much saw it as a destination as opposed to just an add on to, to, to an existing development. So, I mean, Oxford's a fantastic place to live and, and to visit. Um, it's full of life and energy. I think there's over sort of 30,000 students, over 9 million visitors per, per annum. And it's one of the fastest growing cities in the UK. However, it does have its problems. Um, firstly, is the lack of green space within the centre of Oxford. It's predominantly a hard historic city, which is fantastic. But in terms of those accessible green spaces, it's extremely limited. A lot of those green spaces that you see are hidden behind fences and gateways associated with the colleges, and they're not, ex not open to members of the public. Like most of the towns, towns and cities across the UK, um, retail has struggled. Um, and that's the same with Oxford. And that has largely been associated with the poor offer um, and the sort of lack of accessibility and obviously the impact of um, online shopping. Also, I mean, Oxford's famed for its views, for its, uh, its views of the dreaming spires, but there are very few locations or publicly accessible locations where you don't have to pay, where you can actually get up to a point that you can take the views in. So with all that sort of in mind, our, our concept for the roof terrace spaces was focused around sort of three key moves. Firstly, it was to connect the terraces to the context and to the views, and that was Belvedere moments at certain key points within the design and also to develop a kitchen garden theme that would create this sort of rich narrative for the different spaces and linked back to the college gardens and the Oxford Botanical Garden which sat below the roof terrace you can see from the top of the roof terrace spaces and also it was about people and we wanted to create an environment that people would want to go to and to do that we needed to put the infrastructure in place to make it happen so our roof terrace design gifts oxford its first publicly accessible roof garden it's allowed westgate to capitalize on the investment and meet on the challenge meet head on the challenge of online shopping and the lack of space within the city. Running up to March this year, footfall had increased to 8.9% within the city centre and visitors were staying longer than they ever had done before. Um, and, and throughout the seasons, and you'll see from this image here, this was taken in the summer last year, one of the sort of the main spaces, throughout the seasons, it's an extremely busy and popular um, set of spaces. So the actual design itself it comprised a series of different connected spaces, the largest of which was called the kitchen garden, which you'll see here 
on the left, so sorry, the largest of which was called the um, the garden, uh, the kitchen, the, 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 sorry, the um, the kitchen quad, which you'll see here on the bottom right. So that comprised a formal lawn, and it was framed by a row of pleached trees. It had movable seating, and it also has um, a sinuous curved bench, which has a series of of comfortable nooks set back within the planting. Also, there's an elegant pavilion structure which frames views back to Oxford and has a retractable roof which allows um, it to function for various events throughout the year. The next space was the kitchen garden and that space is pictured here on the bottom left and that comprised um, a long linear space which included the cafe spill out spaces, the primary sort of pedestrian thoroughfare along the roof terrace spaces. And to address that, we developed a design which focused around these sinuous planters with integrated seating that faced out to capitalize on the views. Planting was really important and we developed a layer of um, scented strings with a herb layer beneath it, which helped to direct movement and to give character and structure to the spaces. The other space in the top left hand side here was called the garden court and that was connected to another space called the vegetable garden. Now these, these spaces had a slightly more inward facing design language, they were more formal in terms of their character, timber planters as opposed to steel with catenary lighting providing an ambience and a real quality to the environment. Um, they were planted with a sort of cottage garden style with lots of colour, interest and focus. The vegetable garden associated with this was a linear planter, it had recessed seating, and we use lots of different food production species that could be used within the restaurants and the cafes on the roof terrace spaces. Things like artichoke and fennel, which were oversized and actually are, are really strong talking points on the, on the roof terrace as you move through the spaces. So the terraces, they provide an inviting environment with an eclectic mix of restaurants, bars, there's a gym, there's a cinema, but it's much more than just a sort of a shopping experience. It has the right ingredients to meet the challenge that retail and restaurants are currently facing. It has a city centre location, it's accessible via the, from, from a walk from the railway station or from the buses. It has a variety of different spaces that can deal with lots of different um, functions and lots of different needs. It has a really rich garden environment and it has the killer views back across the city. The terraces, they provide the opportunity to socialize on different levels. There's an open lawn space for lounging. There are high tables that can be moved around for people to work on. And there are niche, seat, niche seatings for quiet, for quiet contemplation and discussions. Um, and as most towns and cities have struggled to, do, to, put, to, to respond to social distancing measures by putting in barriers um, and separations between seating areas, almost by accident, the roof, the roof terrace spaces has come into its own. The sense of place and the flexibility in some of the spaces, but also the way that the seating has been designed so that there is a degree of separation between um, different, different seats um, by using the planting to create those, those breaks and the open environment. It has allowed the roof terrace spaces to thrive even in this difficult time. The programming of the spaces brings people together and it was a big part of our brief to focus about to, to, to understand how those spaces could be used throughout the year and the type of events that could be hosted there putting in the, infra, the infrastructure in place to to allow those events to happen was important so we did a lot of modeling looking at capacity of the different spaces and how they could be used the images in the in, in the middle of this slide um, they show this idea of the pavilion that we, we had early on, which, which I refer to, and you can see in the bottom right and left hand side, side of this um, slide. So the idea, it was inspired by a nest of tables and how it could be brought out on a series of rails and configured for different events. Anything from a, a book signing to a fashion show, to a market, to a, a small concert. 
And it has been, the Rift Terrace has been used throughout the year for all sorts of different events. As you'll see here, the bottom right was a small um, food festival. And in the center, it was um, a yoga, so sun, sunset yoga. And to the left, it's um, a recent photograph in the COVID situation that we face at the moment. Gardens in the sky, this was about kind of embracing the, um, the environment and developing really strong, rich garden, gardens that linked back to the, to the narrative. And you'll see here the sort of the pattern, patterning that has been etched into this planter, which was um, linked back to a runner bean pattern, which we sort of carefully crafted and, and backlit to create an ambience. And finally, my final slide, just to say really with, um, whilst the future of retail is unknown, the special offer, including the city centre location, its distinctive engaging spaces, means it appeals to a range of different demographics, breathing new life into Oxford. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Judges, if you want to turn your cameras on, uh, and um, David, if you want to unshare your screen so that we can um, yeah, sure. come back in front of you. So um, uh, Sam has uh, gone, uh, is having some technical difficulties. So uh, we're just going to kick off right now. Ashling, do you want to start um, with any questions? Yeah, thanks. That was great, David. It looks lovely. I love all the, the green space. Um, could you just talk a bit more? You, you mentioned that it attracts different demographics. Can you just talk a bit more about the people who are up there and using the space um, and, and you know how inclusive it, it, it is um, and what they're sort of using the space for? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so being in the centre of the city, obviously, obviously it's an extremely accessible location. It's a short walk from the railway station, short walk from a number of bus the stops. There is a, a, a car park with it as well. So it's extremely accessible and is used by all sorts of different people. Um, some people just come to admire the view, some people are shopping down below and they come up just to escape, to have something to eat, to have a drink. It's open throughout the, the day from, uh, from the morning to the evening, so it can be used at all sorts of different times. Um, and you know, it's it's a family it's a family oriented orientated family focused series of spaces. I mean, I've got a number of of, of young kids, and um, I remember when it was completed, obviously extremely sort of proud <laughs> kind of designer to take his kids there, and just watching them run around the the lawn space and just sort of climb on the seats, and you know, it was great, and and, and it's sort of proof that it it kind of worked. There are accessible lifts, there are escalators taking you up into the roof terrace. So it's, 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 it's very much a place for, for everybody, um, in, including, the, including the young. Catherine, can I invite you in? Mm. Yeah, I, um, I visited this, uh, this site about a year ago as a punter. Okay. So, um, <laughs> so I, I wandered up through the shopping centre and onto the roof and um, wasn't wasn't expecting it to be there. Um, that was a beautiful autumnal day, um, and all your images show beautiful blue sky Oxford days. What about when it's a Manchester weather day? Because with, with it being a destination in itself, how is how is it used on a poor weather day? Yeah, I mean, obviously there, there are some some limitations to ex external spaces when it's pouring yeah. down with rain. But um, the idea of the pavilion structure with the retractable roof, that gave us some, a degree of flexibility to, to host various events when the weather wasn't ideal. Um, there's obviously lots of different restaurants and, and, and terraces, which and the planting does actually provide a degree of separation. And, and, and there are um, parasols and there are um, canopies that extend out of some of the buildings to create a degree of shelter and, and enclosure. I mean, it's one of the things that I particularly think is is great, and because of the sort of the the, the limited spaces within the core of Oxford Centre, this opportunity to even in the rain or the wind to be able to escape the busy city life and um, to be up there 
at an elevated position, looking back across the views, even if there's a bit of rain in your face, and engage with a bit of planting and um, greenery is, is fantastic. Yeah. Uh, I know you're, it's it's a little um, you know tucked away at the top. Uh, was was getting people to discover it uh, initially an issue, or is that still an issue, or, or, or what's your what's its discoverability? Yeah, I mean it's. Um, I guess it took a little. It took it took some time. Some people would go to Westgate and go, "Yeah, I didn't. I didn't know there was um, a roof terrace there." I mean, I think through the marketing company um, and um, the developer, they have focused on that in terms of signage. Um, and I think it's just taken time, you know, to get through word and mouth and um, for people to kind of know what's there. And once they go up there, obviously, the views are so um, striking that um, they tell their friends and, and it's becoming so it's becoming extremely popular um, as I sort of as I said I said at the start as a destination in its own right really um, because of that so it took it took a little bit of time but it is being well used. Ashley do you want to come back in? Uh, just one more um, po post pre COVID, I should say, probably. And mm. um, you know what an impact it's had on the 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 sort of rental levels or commerciality of the the shopping centre. Um, I mean, I don't I, I don't know the figures, but I know that um, um, we had a conversation with the Westgate team um, last week, and um, they were saying that that then then they're back to now. 28% in terms of full um, occupancy and opening at the moment. Um, obviously, there was a slight um, <laughs> downturn um, in the summer, but they are back where where they were planning to be at, at this time, which which is you know which is amazing really, given given the constraints and and the difficulties that um, they faced. I mean, the help to eat out has helped them massively, you know, through 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 August and July. Um, but I don't have, sorry, any figures in terms of <laughs> rent, sorry. Catherine, do you have another question? We've got a bit of time. Well, I'll ask you that um, it's often talked about in terms of uh, the urban heat effect, etc., that we should be greening our rooftops. How practical or impractical is it in terms of retrofitting structures to be, uh, to be greening more roofs than, than this one? And um, and do you see um, do you see urban greening of rooftops as a as a thing that should be done? Yeah, absolutely. I think it I think it's it's a fantastic opportunity. I think one of the constraints is obviously the structure, and they're not going to be suitable for every single roof roof terrace. But we are doing quite a bit of work with various clients at the moment, looking at different ways of achieving achieving build up, so you can achieve different effects. So it doesn't necessarily need to be. As I suppose, as um, intensive or extensive, I think the word is, um, as you've seen in Westgate in terms of the planters, you can do very simple things with very small areas of, of quite uh, shallow areas of soil that can actually be massively effective in terms of biodiverse roofs, green roofs, um, it can have a massive impact um, in the cityscape. So, yeah, absolutely, completely support the more roof terrace spaces that we can do. And, and we know that cities are getting denser and the, um, finding space within the sort of the core of the centre is becoming more and more problematic. So I think we are sort of looking up and I think as we as we move forward, this sort of idea of kind of life being elevated um, is is going to be is going to be something more and more prominent in the industry. History. Thanks so much for that. I um I really enjoyed that uh, that presentation and that discussion. This actually um, concludes these uh, these three presentations. So um, I'm going to uh, to we're going to wrap this session up, and the golden pineapple is um, is going to be announced. Uh, and on Friday the 13th of November, Friday the 13th, don't be frightened. Um, the judges now are going to go and make their uh, deliberations and uh, we'll be ready to announce 
uh, then. But thank you very much to our presenters um, for sharing their stories today uh, about these projects. And thank you very much for our, to our judges for, um, for sharing their questions and, and for all the work they've done in the background too before today, uh, reviewing the submissions and choosing our shortlists and visiting projects. So, um, so uh, yeah, join us uh, again back on um, tomorrow. We'll have more pineapple presentations and, uh, and we'll see you on the 13th for who gets the golden pineapple. And now we're gonna go hear some interesting discussion. So thanks very much. Thanks very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Cheers. Bye.